Well, welcome to this episode of InfoSec Journeys. Ashley and I are delighted today to be joined by uh, Tom Hudson, aka Tom Nom Nom, someone that we really admire in the industry in information security, security research, uh, and also um, uh, enormous contributions that he has in the bug bounty space as well. And we've got lots to explore uh, in that particular environment as well. Uh, we're super excited to have you here today, Tom. Why don't I just throw over to you for a quick intro? Tell us who you are and, and what you're all about sure uh, firstly uh, thanks for having me uh, it's an, an honor to be here talking with you both uh, so like I said I'm Tom Hudson aka Tom Nom Nom I'm a uh, tinkerer slash software engineer turned security researcher uh, I guess is probably the best way to put it uh, best known for uh, writing rather a lot of small open source tools that are uh, up on github um, and somehow having more followers on Twitter than I deserve to have. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm from the UK. I'm in my 30s. Uh, so probably uh, about all I can come up with for you. I think. <laughs> Sounds good. That's all good. No, we've we've definitely got. Uh, I'm a huge admirer of of the tool suite that you've written and released on on GitHub. I think even if those were commercial tools, a lot of people would buy them. Um, you know, and we we can definitely talk about that. And I know you're super proud of Gron as an example, which is included as uh, by default in in uh, you know the Linux kind of. Um, um in in stores and stuff which is amazing um so yeah so so tell us a bit then you know i i think i i will go so far as to say i think you've downplayed yourself there you know a tinkerer a coder and and also security researcher um at detectify tell us what you kind of do then what kind of what kind of stuff do you get involved in uh on a day-to-day -day basis um uh, in your in your current role and we'll and we'll rewind a little bit as to where that started yeah uh, so at the moment, at uh, Detectify, I firstly am uh, a team lead slash manager these days. So uh, I spend a reasonable amount of my time doing uh, team type stuff uh, rather than security type stuff, which is cool uh, because it means I get to enable lots of other people to do cool security research and that sort of thing, which, uh, you know, is a bit of a, a force multiplier. Like if you can do, uh, you know, X amount of work yourself, that's great, but if you can uh, enable other people to do some multiple of X amount of work instead, and you know that that that's a more effective use of your time, pretty much. If you can teach people, train people, and uh, and that sort of thing, I, I think that's uh, a really good use of your time. Uh, I do still work on uh, security research type stuff though, uh, which is awesome. So mostly stuff around uh, improving the capabilities of the scanners at Detectify. Um, I think that's quite a big part. So both in finding you know, vulnerabilities and things for it to look for, uh, but also uh, in adding things so that we can look for new types of vulnerabilities. So uh, for example, recently been involved in adding capabilities for looking for DOM-based vulnerabilities. So kind of client-side JavaScript stuff, uh, which is uh, quite different from most uh, security scanners, I think, mm. uh, or, or at least the sort of, you know, traditional uh, kind of things that are looking at HTTP requests and responses and analyzing the responses. Turns out really, really hard to statically analyze JavaScript. <laughs> um, pretty, pretty much impossible, in fact. So, you know, there's, there's some other things you've got to do. So um, I've worked on some of that uh, kind of stuff, uh, which has been good fun. Mm. Um, I, and just generally uh, helping people out with security knowledge, uh, I suppose, is, is a big part of it. So, you know, Detectify is a growing company. Uh, we have sales teams and, and all that sort of thing. Not everybody is a security expert. Everybody has uh, like a, a way above average knowledge for sure. Uh, but there's quite often situations where. Uh, Someone will say, oh, you know, we're talking to a customer about something and we don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Please help. Uh, and, you know, always happy to do that sort of thing. Um, I have a bit of background as a trainer, so I'm quite used to starting explaining things from first principles, which I think is 
uh, turns out to be one of the most useful skills I've developed. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's, uh, it's a really good point, isn't it? Because when you think about, um, you know, super technical security uh, solutions like Detectify offer, and you think, yeah, there's, there's a there's a poor team there that have got to understand all of this capability and go and articulate that in a way that's meaningful to a customer to go and buy it. Um, you know, talk about DOM, XSS, JavaScript, and you know, post messaging you know, APIs and all the rest of it. Then you're going to lose people pretty quickly, I guess. So, um, yeah, how, how do you kind of translate that then? What what kind of uh, skills have you developed over time to kind of tr make that you know a translatable message for sales teams? Uh, I think one of the main things for me is just learning to know your audience, which is, you know, it takes practice uh, for mm -hmm. sure. And the way you practice that is by explaining lots of things to lots of people. Uh, and that gives you a much better appreciation of uh, the variety of levels of understanding that people will have and how you can approach each of them. Um, mm -hmm. And there's an element of just knowing your audience in terms of being able to pick the right analogies as well. Right. So, you have a bit of chit chat with someone, you find out that they are, uh, for example, interested in cooking. And you're like, right, we're going to use cooking analogies now. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I, I quite like cooking and especially eating, um, which is uh, part of the reason for the, the Tom Nom Nom uh, moniker. But uh, so, you know, I reach for things like food analogies and things like that quite a lot. But the number one thing for me is, uh, I always try to give people an understanding of how things work uh, because that's the way I've always learned things. Uh, and it's, you know, caused me to struggle a bit in life at times uh, in at school, especially when they were trying to explain how to do something without um, how the underlying thing works and why. Uh, and I, mm -hmm. I just struggled to accept things at face value. So, um, but you know, later in life, I think it became a bit of an asset. Um, so. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, that 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 mindset in in academic circles, it's it's almost like you need to just accept what we're telling you and don't question it. And mm. it's it's almost when you break into the career world, the, you know, the um, you know, an organization and stuff that you need to develop the mindset of saying, well, don't accept anything at face value. You need you really need to question, you know, how we're how we're you know doing something, how you know what, uh, how we can progress, etc. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether that's something we need to focus on in the UK. Uh, in like in academia especially like if you ever try and read like a white paper or, or a scientific paper from a journal it's so difficult yeah like because the way they're written the onus is on the reader to understand what is being said uh, and i don't like that I, I much prefer that the onus is on the writer to make sure that it is understood uh, and you know that takes more time it takes more effort um, uh, and i understand why it's not done I mean, kind of like a don't repeat yourself sort of a way. Mm. You know, if you're reading our paper and you don't understand this, go off and read these other five papers who also refer to another five papers and require you to have a degree in the discipline and all that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of a shame. There's some really interesting uh, pieces of information out there uh, that are just not explained in a way that, that a layman can uh, even begin to read about. Mm, so you're right. how do you um, um so you know being in a extremely or you know very technical role that you are um how do you find explaining very technical details and concepts to people that might not be that technical at all you know mm -hmm. maybe some of the c-suite or um that is in a, a management position uh, i know you mentioned that knowing your audience but uh, one of the things that you know i've i've might have struggled with in the past is actually dumbing down you know very complicated solutions but in the in the when you do when you do try to dumb things down it loses like it's either gravitas or actually it's context so like have you got any tips of of taking hard topics and making them simple like like you said relating them to food or is there other, anything anything else or any other way you've done it yeah so like choice of analogies is is a really um useful uh skill to develop uh, but i think the main thing for me uh, is just starting at first principles pretty much every time so uh let's pick an example so if we were going to explain uh cause for example so like cross origin resource sharing that's for someone with no knowledge of web development or, or anything like that that's a pretty hard topic right um but 
you can start at something you know people understand without even having to ask. So you sort of go, okay, you understand that web browsers exist, right? Uh, and websites exist. So that's where I'm going to start. Um, and that requires for me to have an understanding of how it all fits together. Uh, but you can sort of go through and say, okay, you know, when you're using a web browser uh, and, and you go to a website, let's say you go to Facebook and also you log into your online banking, uh, you would hope that they can't talk to each other, right? You don't want Facebook knowing what your bank balance is. And so, you know, that's true. And, and web browsers have this thing called the same origin policy, which means if some code comes from a website, um, it can't interact directly with another website. It has to be from the same, it can only interact with the same origin that it came from. Uh, but occasionally we want for websites to be able to talk to each other. And so we introduce this thing called cross origin resource sharing, which allows a website to specify explicitly which other websites are able to talk to it, right? So you don't have to get too technical to get at the reason for why something exists uh, and, and note in that we didn't talk about headers we didn't talk about uh, javascript we didn't even mention it or anything like that um, but i think understanding why something exists is is the first thing for me and the temptation as a you know someone with a technical background is to explain how Mm. instead it's oh well i send this uh, you know access control allow origin head that's useless <laughs> to this person because they're never going to implement it they want to know why it exists uh, and, and i think that's kind of part of, of knowing your audience is knowing well what are they going to use this information for um and you know in this case it might be explaining to a customer why the vulnerability we flagged uh, is important um, and, and you don't need to know about HTTP headers or anything like that. So mm. uh, I think knowing what to leave out uh, is is really important too. That's a really good insight. First principles um, and and those and choosing those analogies. I think that's really um, a really powerful. <clears throat> I think also as well. Next time I'm on the phone to my mother-in-law and she's trying to, I might I might conference you in, Tom, and you can help me explain some stuff to her, <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> especially about cooking. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, with your super technical background of coding, especially software development, solutions architect, technical trainer, I think, you know, someone in their bedroom who can write a bit of Python is one thing, but teaching people how to uh, develop code, develop software uh, securely as well, uh, that matter, and also train people is a whole boatload of different skill sets there. So what what did that kind of look like for you during your career in terms of your progression? I guess start out with how how did you learn to code? Where did that come from? Uh, so originally, I think it, it kind of came out of not necessity, uh, but, it, but it was just kind of a natural progression of starting out with being fascinated with how things work, um, you know, from just machinery or, or even simple devices and things like, you know, we have a vacuum cleaner. How does a vacuum cleaner work? It's got an electric motor in it. How does the motor work? And so on and so forth. And then, you know, at some point we got, uh, I think the ZX Spectrum was our first thing that could be described as a computer that, that I was aware of. Uh, and I was incredibly interested in how it worked, but a bit too young to really uh, sort of figure it out. Um, sometime later we got a PC, um, uh, and I just explored everything that, that was there um, uh, and some point discovered QBasic and went to a book from the library and made it play tunes and ask me questions and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> and like, made a quiz, really basic stuff. Um, and then when I got to high school, I got access to the internet uh, and again, was completely blown away by it because I just about explored everything I could easily explore on our home PC that wasn't connected to the internet. And suddenly there was this whole extra thing. And I was like, wow, I want to make a website because why would I not? Mm. Um, and I, you know, found like GeoCities and things like that. And they didn't really interest me that much because I wanted to understand how they worked. So, 
uh, as soon as I discovered that you could view the source of a web page, <laughs> that was perfect because uh, I didn't have to go and get a book or anything. I could just reverse engineer how it was done, uh, you know. Uh, and then <laughs> at the time, I was building a website without uh, access to the internet at home. So I was uh, printing stuff out at school, like view source, and then print um, and, and trying to figure out what each bit did uh, and implementing it at home uh, and trying to make it work there. And then sort of try to bring it back into school on a floppy disk and get it uploaded to uh, Tripod, I think, because it was the web host <laughs> that I used. Um, but I did eventually, you know, get a couple of books and that sort of thing. And I never read them cover to cover, but I... Uh, I, I read the parts that I needed to know uh, and at some point I remember looking at forms and thinking well they can kind of do stuff with this JavaScript thing that I've learned about from hotscripts.com or, or whatever it was where you can go and copy and paste other people's JavaScript um, but I was really interested in how all of these other websites did stuff like let you buy things and you know the server side was really opaque because you couldn't just view source and see what it was doing. So mm. um, at some point I found out about PHP, um, managed to get myself a book on it and, and figured out uh, how to use it to do the things I wanted. I think the project that I had in mind at the time was to write a guest book. Um, that was the thing that you had on the web in, in the late 90s was a, a guest book. So people could sign your guest book. It's like comments, really. Yeah. It's a comment section but just like a global comment section for your website. Um, and there was a few uh, like off the shelf solutions that you could get, but they were all really complicated Perl scripts and things like that. You had to uh, have full control over your server to get running properly. And I just had some like shared web hosting that I'd convinced my parents to pay for for me. Um, so I was like, I'm going to write my own. So I wrote one that like stored um, the data in a text file because I, you know, databases are scary. Um, and I, I, I kind of hammered away at those sorts of things, but it was always sort of came from a place of, I want to make this thing. How do I do it? Hmm. Uh, I was never really learning programming for the sake of it. It was a tool. Um, and, you know, sometime later, I managed to get a job uh, doing tech support in primary schools um at a, at a company that a friend of mine founded so you know incredibly lucky in that respect um i know it's installing networks and doing uh like re-imaging of machines and and that sort of thing fixing issues that the school were having with their computers um and we had a bunch of engineers doing the same and we needed a way to manage them so at some point i went i'm gonna write a ticket management system <laughs> and i'm gonna use my my sequel uh, and, you know, in hindsight, it was horrible, but it, it was, again, it was a thing. We need something to handle this problem. I'm going to make it. I didn't consider myself to be a programmer. Um, <laughs> and, and in hindsight, rightly so. But, uh, you know, eventually that spiraled into my next job where I was hired as a programmer, despite having explicitly said in my interview, I am not a programmer. <laughs> I'm a guy who solves problems with computers and sometimes that means you have to write code uh so i've just sort of accepted it as something i need to do but um that's, that that's was... probably the mindset they like though because they thought i don't want someone who just thinks they're a program i need someone who's mm -hmm. outside of that box a little bit yeah definitely like if i can solve this problem by running some commands or something instead mm -hmm. uh that, then why not right um but uh you know that that was the point that i really sort of became someone who could probably call themselves a programmer because I just did so much of it. Mm -hmm. um, and in a really complicated uh, web application as well, that was, you know, pushing a million lines of, of PHP. So I, I had to, I was in the, the deep end. I didn't even know what classes were when mm -hmm. I started that job. Uh, and within, you know, three months, I was talking about object oriented programming with people. I love it. And, Gee, wow. uh, and, and when you do something seven, eight hours a day, Mm. turns out you learn it really quickly mm. so where did the um if we went back to the beginning where did that inquisitive nature come from you know the the the, the want to know more to know deeper to not you know not just accept the 
at what the, the books are telling you, but to actually do it yourself and 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 prove prove the theory. I mean, where did that come from? Um, I think it's kind of hard to say. I think it definitely started really early because, um, you know, my parents moved house uh, when I was about two or ish, and I was either given or found some screwdrivers and just started taking things apart so, <laughs> so you know like really simple things like i don't think you would have been given a screwdriver at the age of two tom if i'm honest with you but i i, I believe i was given i definitely got a tool <laughs> set for my fourth birthday <laughs> nice um, so and, and, you know it was silly things like taking up the carpet tracks that, that hold right. the carpet between uh, under a do- in a doorway things like that and then not having the strength to screw them back down and mm. <laughs> damaging the doors um and like i think i again don't remember but have been told by my parents that like i took a tap apart when i was about three or so <laughs> um and you know i so it's always been with me really as this thing of i want to know what's on the inside how do things work um all of my favorite books as a child were uh how do things work so mm. i had like a series of books in, in like a box set that was a different topic for each one so there was one on how like construction machines work there's one on how transport stuff works there's one on how like the human body works as well which was you know still interesting but but in a different way mm. and i think a certain amount of credit should probably go to my father who uh has a lifelong uh interest in motorcycles uh, especially uh the motorcycles that were around when he was a kid the old british uh bsas and nortons and things like that from like the 50s um, and the 60s to an extent um and you know his first bike was i think two pounds or something which was a bit more than it is at the moment but it arrived in buckets uh like it was not new at all it was like a failed restoration project so really? his fir- very first thing he had to do was assemble it and get it working uh and and that turned into a lifelong hobby for him of, of stripping that doing like the nut and bolts restoration of those and that sort of stuff was going on around me mm. uh, when i was a kid and you know i wanted to help mm. uh, and i would always ask you know what's this bit and, and how does this bit work and he would he would explain uh, so I think that sort of mechanical interest in how things work definitely had something to do with him. Uh, and, and, you know, throughout my childhood, uh, I was encouraged in some ways. I, I was occasionally in trouble for taking things apart I shouldn't have done. Uh, but, for example, my grandfather, would, who was also you know, had quite a scientific mind, um, having uh, had a career in the post office, which is... Uh, nowadays, I, I guess, doesn't sound that glamorous, but back then, there's, you know, they were a technological institution. They did mm. things with signals and all sorts of uh, interesting new technology. Uh, but, uh, you know, if he came across something that was broken, he would save it until the next time I visited so that we could take <laughs> it apart and, and find out how it worked. So I, That's I, awesome. got, a of, I got a lot of encouragement uh, in that respect, which I'm incredibly thankful for. Um, but uh, yeah I I, I think that's probably the main uh, parts yeah that's really fascinating Um, and I guess that support network around you is really uh, really contributed to your um, to your kind of ethos and mindset and stuff Um, I I, I guess I'm keen to know then from uh, uh, from the academic side when you were at school and you learned um or certainly probably encouraged to learn you know more about coding and web coding and things like that how, how did that translate into the real world um when you when you were you know working as your first uh, programming job like did it do you think or, or maybe actually the question more relevant is do you think you know that the from the academic circles today the stuff that gets taught in schools is really translatable to the real world environment um i, I think a lot of it is uh, I think there's definitely stuff that's that's missing. Um, so for the record, like the stuff I learned at school was stuff I learned at lunchtime uh, mm. and uh, and break times and things when I was you know going on the internet and reversing things. Uh, for the most part, that was stuff I was teaching myself. 
Hmm. Um, I had some teachers who were really great and really supportive. Um, uh, but a lot of that was in the area of things like electronics, for example, and, and design technology I, I was really interested in. So and we had a young engineers after school club that I always used to go to <laughs> and build robots and stuff like that. So like uh, our young engineers club built a robot that got into the robot wars, for example. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I was always into like RC cars and, and still am uh, as well. So all of that related sort of stuff. Um, but my IT teachers were, some of them were really good, but mostly I was in a generation where IT at school was about learning to use Microsoft Office, right? Yeah, so, Excel. <laughs> yeah, my sister, who's a couple, of, she's a couple of school years ahead of me, um, older than me, um, she learned some programming in IT at school. So she learned some QBasic uh, as it happens. Um, and, and that sort of helped me out. She sort of showed me, there's this thing called Cube Basic. Here's how you make a clear tune. And I kind of ran with it. <laughs> um, but then by the time I got to it, they weren't doing that anymore. The curriculum had kind of changed. And it was all about spreadsheets and my, mm. making database with Microsoft Access and stuff. We did much later do a little bit of HTML. But by that point, I'd already taught myself how to do it. Yeah, um, uh, and actually, after we'd learned the very basics, they said, "And now you use Microsoft Front Page." <laughs> I remember Front uh, Page, man. <laughs> which yeah. you know, I, I point blank refused to do, of course, um, and and wrote stuff in in raw HTML instead in Notepad, no syntax highlighting. Only Brilliant. Windows yeah. ninety old school, proper old had. school. Yeah, um, I and, love it. And now look at you with Vim. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a far cry. I, I, I mean, what was it? A hundred, nearly a hundred thousand views for your Vim tutorial with Stir yeah, Credit, crazy. man. And that's amazing. Really um, crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, as it happened, after I was at school, it changed kind of back to how it was. And they started introducing doing programming with Scratch <laughs> and Python and stuff like that. Um, and just by complete bad luck and just kind of missed out on that there was about three mm. four years in the 90s where they were like the future of computing is using applications it's not mm. not programming for, for whatever reason that was um so the stuff i learned at school um i think some things were useful in like a secondary sort of a way like uh, you know, maths and, uh, and electronics knowledge and things like that was occasionally useful in terms of like systems thinking, but um, directly there wasn't a great deal of it. Um, mm. For like, for, as far as modern education is concerned, I have a reasonable amount of insight into university level education because uh, as part of my role as a technical trainer, I helped uh, develop a, a, effectively a master's level program um, with uh, Sheffield Hallam University to run for a graduate program where I was previously working. Um, so I had a, quite a lot of input into that in terms of the things we should be teaching and things we shouldn't uh, and the things that we really need uh, to fill the gaps in. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's uh, it's relatively common knowledge uh, for the most part, but things like a lot of university courses don't really teach you to use version control, or at least they didn't a few years ago. I think they're getting better <laughs> at it now with like the popular popularity of GitHub, for example. Mm. Um, but you know, there's people with software engineering degrees who are like, I don't really understand version control, which is fine. You know, we did effectively a gap analysis on it and sort of said, here are the things you need to know to start working as a professional software engineer. Here are the things you've taught. Let's fill the gaps. Mm. Um, with a decent amount of input from the university in terms of what we actually need to do in order to call it a master's and have it accredited and all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, there was a fair amount of input from my perspective there where, like, they said, oh, well, we want to teach... Um, stored procedures for example in databases i said no <laughs> let's spend that time teaching something else instead because we don't use them yeah um and, and like the, there's a certain element of there are uh some amazing incredibly smart academics i'm not downplaying them 
but many of them haven't spent a great deal of time in industry for a while. That's, that's what's missing, isn't it? It's that kind of cross sharing of uh, what's going on and how the landscape is changing and, and how that translates back to education. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. How did you um how did you become a trainer? Like how did how did that happen? It was it was it a a want to share your knowledge or was it, you know, someone asking you to, you know, input? Yeah, I, I think it started off that way. Um, like there was a certain amount of how I wanted to share what I knew. Um, but also uh, there was a big part of uh, just identifying gaps, so to speak. So uh, I was, uh, let me think, I think I was leading a software engineering team. Um, and really it was like, it was a, it was more than just software engineers who were involved in this sort of product team. So, you know, we have product owners and, uh, and that sort of thing, scrum masters. And, uh, but what struck me was that we had people across the company who were trying to prioritize what programmers were doing without understanding programming. Um, and occasionally there was friction as a result because you would say this thing seems really simple why is it taking so long or occasionally the opposite as well you know I, this must be really complicated to do and a programmer goes nope one line of code mm. there you go it's done uh, and i think a lot of that came from a misunderstanding of what programming even really was uh, and entailed uh, and the level you had to think about so uh, i decided i was going to solve this problem uh, kind of the same as a lot of the things we were talking about is there was a need and I decided I was going to address it I'd never re I'd never like really run workshops and things before that um but I decided I was going to run this coding for beginners workshop brilliant like a three-hour introduction write your first program sort of a thing so you know I picked a few different programming languages and a bunch of different programs and went and wrote maybe five, six programs in five or six different programming languages, and then went and tried to explain them to people uh, and ended up deciding that Ruby was was going to be the way to go. I had the least <laughs> amount of things to explain. Uh, and I picked a few programs. I tried to make them fun. So like, we did like a higher or lower game and then and, and punctuated with a hangman game. Uh, and I just ran these workshops you know I, <laughs> it wasn't a case of you know i went to management and said oh, i mm. have this idea I, was, I just booked it i put it in the calendar and sent out like a i think we had slack by that point so i probably a slack message saying hey do you want to learn what programming is come and come and find out uh and it went down really really well i think uh, that's what i mean certainly from what you've, you you've been talking about you know the underlying theme there is your proactive mindset right you know to to not wait to be fed information but to go out and find it and then not only that um you know the appetite to share that information with people certainly in your immediate uh, surroundings in the workplace it, it it's surprising how many people are are open to say do you know what yeah i, I actually I, they don't know they want to know about it until you come up with the idea and say hey do you fancy learning about some code oh yeah actually i do yeah. um and it really benefits them yeah definitely yeah. um but yeah like so, we're, so I, I guess you've probably spent maybe 10 15 years developing software in your career there to make things work right and then at some stage in your career you've been you've developed this capability to break stuff and to and to uh um exploit that with uh for the for the greater good of the internet i must add for we've been the bug bounty space right for an awful lot of companies who are who, who run bug bounty programs because for whatever reason whether they, they they need to tick a box to say they have a program or whether they generally need to crowdsource their uh their application security um but where did that kind of how did you discover the, the bug bounty world then? How did you discover that you could break stuff and actually help other businesses outside of, I guess it's kind of like a side hustle, isn't it? From, from what you were doing in the, in the, uh, in yeah. the uh, mainstream employment space. Yeah. Uh, kind of. Uh, so I think it's something that I like the hacking scene and, and the whole idea of it, something that's always interested me. Uh, partly from a technical perspective, but also just from like a mystique sort of perspective, you know? So like I, I think I've mentioned this uh, before, uh, 
in, in a different interview with someone else, but like I remember reading about DEF CON in .NET magazine sometime in the late 90s. Like a couple of their editors went out to DEF CON and they did like a whole multi-page piece about how, like what it was like and what people were doing. Um, and they were talking about like the first war driving uh, <laughs> competition, which is because, you know, Wi-Fi networks were just sort of starting to appear. So there was war driving was this big thing. You go and discover all of the Wi-Fi networks. And, um, you know, it just sounded like such an incredible place to be with these crazy smart people to learn from. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the whole sort of hacking thing for me is very similar to the taking things apart. Hmm. Like, you, there's an expression that gets banded about a lot, which is hack to learn, not learn to hack. Uh, and, and that resonates with me quite strongly because what I'm usually doing is trying to figure out how something works. And I think part of that is figuring out where things break down um like if you figure out where the boundaries are where the edge cases are that gives you a lot of insight into how something actually works rather than how it appears to work at face value um uh, and often <laughs> you know it can be quite scary when you realize that things are held together with string and, and sticky tape it's surprising isn't it what you find yeah. especially in in major organizations definitely and I, I, I guess you know for those um, for those of our audience who who maybe are not au fait with the bug bounty community, uh, may, maybe just describe um, who Hacker One are, the live event kind of scenario as well, and also um, you know I know a couple of years ago now, uh, in fact when was it you you got your MVH in London? Uh, that's a good question. Is it a bit more than a year ago? Yeah. yeah, I should Google it. But I think uh, if you could talk about what that is as well, what what an MVH is and what that meant for you yeah, in terms of putting you on the map, if you like, with respect to your your kind of uh, contributions in this area, that would be awesome. Uh, sure. So uh, I suppose it, it makes sense to talk about how I got into Book Bounty uh, as a way to explain that stuff, um, which was actually that my previous employer launched a Book Bounty program. Um so, you know, the, there were some really, really good people in the security team there who were um, have very up-to-date thinking, I think is probably a good way to put it. They were always mm. looking for ways to improve our security posture. And they launched this bug bounty program thing. Um, and they did something which is actually, I found out later, really unusual, which is they launched it to staff. Um, that is unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But actually, I now think makes a lot of sense because yeah. you want to find all your bugs, right? Who's going to be good at that? The people who know the systems really well. Mm. They know all the ins and outs and all of the obscure bits of it, the bits that have been neglected because they've got tech debt on their backlog, right? Mm. Saying this thing needs to be fixed. Like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to go and see what's wrong with it. Um, so uh, that was how I got into it originally. Um, and from my perspective, I was just looking at this one program, uh, and they used Hacker One, right, to to use their to run their program. So Hacker One is a bug bounty platform who host bug bounty programs. Uh, so they're kind of an intermediary between companies want to know where their vulnerabilities are, hackers want money, as do we all, uh, and Hacker One join those two people together uh, as a host, uh, an int intermediary between the two. Um, and there are you know, other platforms as well. We've got Integrity in, in Europe who are doing really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Bug Crowd, and there's others who are, take a slightly different approach and more, more selective, like Synac and things who have like... Uh, I'm not on Synac, so I don't really know. <laughs> but I think they have like an entrance exam, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> to sort of prove that you're good enough. Um, which is, you know, it's fine. It's just different. Um, so I, you know, was, was hacking on this uh, company program. Uh, and I knew that relative to other people in the company, I was doing very well at it. Um, and, and I think part of that was, uh, a need. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but uh, you know, I had a wedding booked yeah. and not fully paid for. Uh, so uh, I was like, this is amazing. This is a source of income. 
um and like the first bug i found got paid out like a thousand dollars or something like that which was amazing like, yeah crazy uh so i was like instantly hooked what was it out of interest what did you find Do you remember? Uh, it was a ssrf come lfi uh, nice that's a good one <laughs> to so, get started <laughs> yeah and, and you know i been a programmer a long time and i'd had secure mm. coding training and things so i knew the the other side of how to protect against these things which mm. uh really helped in in figuring out uh what to do but you know in this case it was sort of i could read a local config file that gave me the address and credentials of an internal api that i could then hit with the same ssrf and brilliant uh, <laughs> brilliant you know and hit things i was not supposed to be able to get to so uh pretty uh pretty impactful uh and and you know that was a big adrenaline rush and all that sort of thing like i literally ran to the security team to say oh, man, this thing. <laughs> amazing the the bug bounty program launched literally half an hour before that amazing uh, so i was you know super super excited having thought maybe i was going to make a couple of hundred dollars uh or, or something like that so that went nice well. Uh, but you know, I kept going. Uh, that's what I spent my lunch times doing for uh, six months or something like that. Uh, and I hadn't really looked at the rest of Hacker One. Mm. Uh, I hadn't realized that there was a leaderboard, for example. Um, and it turned out I was on it uh, <laughs> wow. just from hitting this one program really hard. Um, uh, and I kind of felt like a little bit of a fraud uh, when I found out because I was like, I'm just on this one program. Mm. You know, uh, surely everyone else on here is submitting to lots of programs and, you know, felt like an imposter. Later on, found that's not really the case and it's pretty common uh, to do that. But you look at Doggy G, you know what I mean? I think it's yeah. like predominantly one program. You know, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Lots of people are. Lots of people are. Um, yeah. Um, Try to and you're and you're if I remember rightly, program. I think you're you're still ranked top fifty seven. You're fifty seventh, I think, at the moment on the all time okay. leaderboard, which is it's, to say that's impressive. It's an understatement, I think, and, and especially when you look at the names that are surrounded there. Um, you know, no, so, I've, uh, I've not really done much for a year, so to, right, to stay there is pretty pleasing. Um, very impressive indeed. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, so I, I got an an email out of the blue pretty much or not or not quite so i had one kind of little subtle hint that hacker one had noticed me which was we ran a charity hackathon at work um where we just submitted bugs to our bug bounty program but we paid to, to charity instead nice uh, and uh hacker one had one of their people over in the country at the time and they said you know i will stop by Oh, and by the way, we have a T-shirt for Tom Nom Nom. <laughs> I was, what? <laughs> Why are they singling me out? You know, amazing. Uh, like, so that that was kind of a, a bit weird, but I was really pleased about it. Um, and uh, so that was Russell. Russell is a really great guy. He's in in the London office at Hacker One now, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so I met Russell, and then a little while later, I got uh, an email out of the blue saying hey, we'd like to invite you to Amsterdam for Amazing. an event, for a live hacking event. Uh, I was firstly, a, you know, a little suspicious, uh, I think is probably a thing, because that sort of thing doesn't usually happen. You know, sort of maybe an invite to an event in Amsterdam and you have mm. to pay your way, fair enough. But they're like, no, you know, we'll, we'll pay your flight as an accommodation. Um, uh, but that event was on the day, I can tell you exactly when it was, it was the 20th of May, uh, because that was the day that I got married. Uh, mm. So I could not go uh, to that event. Uh, and it was apparently the first person in the history of Hacker One Live events to turn down an invite. Oh, my but word. I had a uh, yeah, it makes you even more elusive. I love it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and you know, I got, I got a reply back saying, "That's fine. Uh, will we be seeing you at DefCon?" Uh, <laughs> I said, "No, because you know, flights are a thousand pounds, and mm. I don't even work in security." 
you know, I'd, I'd wanted it to go since mm-hmm. like about 1999 when I read about it in .NET magazine uh, and read about all the war driving and stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm not going to be there. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we will bring you out to Vegas. Amazing. Um, Absolutely festive. amazing. Yeah. And, you know, for, for this live event. And honestly, you know, I wasn't in the Bug Bounty community. I didn't follow anyone on Twitter. I wasn't on the Bug Bounty forum. I didn't know anybody outside mm. of the people that I worked with. I hadn't heard of Franz Rosen, you know. Mm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, like honestly my first thought was like are you trying to hire me yeah or or something because you know this isn't the kind of thing people do is it um but you know i had a couple of emails back and forth and and went out to vegas and met everybody and everyone was really friendly i've had the biggest dose of imposter syndrome <laughs> but you know i'm how, how do you deal with that then because like i i imagine yeah. if you look back there's some superstars there that you met right mm-hmm. in the in the bug bounty world i dare say no harm sec and people like that of that ilk yeah definitely um what what did that feel like then like well uh i guess i kind of had an advantage in that respect because i didn't know who they were um, yeah uh i think i remember knowing who mark litchfield was mm um because i'd either like i'd read an article about so he was the first million dollar hacker i think yeah on hacker one he was the first to make a million dollars in bounties and i'd seen the article about that so i knew who he was um but other than that you know i didn't i didn't really i didn't know anybody so it wasn't a big deal um i mean i was intimidated because i was like these people are all smarter than me i'm not supposed to be here they've made a mistake um and, you know, in the end, I made like a few thousand dollars in, in bounties and was you know, completely blown away by the whole experience. Hooked, met lots yeah. of people, had a great time. Um, and, and I think, you know, critically got myself invited onto like the Bug Bounty Forum Slack uh, and started following some people on Twitter. So mm. um, when, I, when, was uh, the, uh, uh, when was the point that you knew that, that you you were... You were you were there. You were in that club of uh, top level security researchers. Was it was it going out to DefCon and getting that invite, or did it come later? Uh, much later, I think, uh, is the thing. So, sometime after that, um, I kind of I managed to develop like a circle, a small circle of friends uh, in that community. And, you know, I'd started writing a few tools because that was just my nature of things. Mm. I want to achieve this thing. I'm going to write a tool to do it. Um, And I just put them up on GitHub. Uh, And there was a couple of people who took notice and started using them as well. So like Ed Overflow uh, is probably one of the first people other than me to use one of my tools, I I think. so uh, you know, I, and I met met him in Vegas. Uh, there's there's pictures of us sat next to each other in a uh, little hut next to a pool on a hotel rooftop, packing away. Nice. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I, I had that sort of circle of friends, um, and then a few more people started using the tools as I started to write more of them and that sort of thing. Um, but but then uh, I got. Uh, an invite to a London event. Uh, and I sort of missed a few live events because I, you know, I started to burn out at this point and uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but got in, invited to this London event because I was in London and that meant I was cheap, right? No, not in London. I was in the UK, sorry. Yeah. Which meant that I, it wasn't a thousand dollar plane ticket, it was like a hundred dollar train ticket instead (laughs) so like oh invite tom um not been to a few of the previous events because he's not been like active on the platform or anything but we'll invite tom Uh, and i got really lucky uh, on that event i found a couple of really really hard-hitting issues with some techniques that i'd been working on at the time that happened to pay off for that target Uh, and i ended up getting the mvh award the most valuable hacker for the event and uh june 2019 is when i can see the tweets from hacker one is that okay yeah 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 that sounds about right so it's a bit more than a year ago 
Um, mm. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it it was incredible. Um, because I, I can, I'm looking at the photo of you holding the belt against the sheep at the moment, and it's just <laughs> it fucking blows my mind. It's amazing. The uh, yeah, and, and it did for me as well because like I had a goal for uh, the live events, which was to do show and tell, right? So every Hacker One live event, possibly my favorite part of the event, and I think that's true for a lot of people as well, is they do mm. a show and tell at the end of the event where people get to demo the bugs they found before they've been fixed, which is, and you know, the, the tar people who work for the target are there. So, you know, it's with their permission uh, and everyone's kind of has to be trusted uh, <laughs> to be shown this stuff. Uh, and some things do get redacted, like the exact URLs of things are on, but you get a demo of what people have found, more importantly, how people found them as well, which is this really great knowledge sharing opportunity. You just don't, really get outside of that where we've all been looking at the same target for weeks and then you get to see what someone else found on that target that you didn't um so you have like a really direct comparison of approaches uh, mm -hmm. in that way uh, and i i'd never done it show and tell because the stuff i'd found had always been like cross-site scripting or <laughs> you know no one wants to see you pop an alert in a show and tell unless it's in a particularly obscure way. Like it was yeah. always the RCEs, the SSRFs, and that kind of thing. Uh, so I had this goal to do a show and tell, and then uh, for the, I'd never done one, but for the London event, I got two slots in the show and tell. I'd found three bugs, and I was asked to demo two of them. Amazing. Uh, so <laughs> I was like, "Wow, this is amazing." And then they did the NVH announcement, and it was me, uh, which was a massive surprise to me, although apparently not to everybody, uh, because afterwards I got a message from France uh, with a video attached of him filming me before the announcement was made. <laughs> <laughs> it was like he was stood behind me filming me, going, "It's gonna be Tom, definitely." That's amazing. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, I, I was the only one who was surprised, apparently. Uh, and what's um, it based on then? How did they? Is it like the the dollar amount that you earn, or is it other factors that contribute to? It's other factors as well. So, um, the, the MVH is about impact, but it's also about community contributions. It's about how you worked with the target, mm. um, uh, and you know a variety of uh, of factors impact is a big deal which is you know highly color correlated with dollar amount mm. um, and you know like the the biggest bug i found there was a that was a 40k bug um Amazing. so it, it was definitely impactful um I split three ways with my team as well so i, I was hacking with uh justin uh Reinerator and Zan yeah and uh, and I what a like, team! Wow. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know you're part of Disturbance now, but I mean, that's a that's a core, cool, cool team, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, both Justin and Sam find some amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd said before I found anything, I was like, equal split. We're gonna do it. Equal nice. Uh, expecting to make five hundred dollars, you know, uh, and then did that. And I was like, you know, I'm not gonna be that guy who uh, says equal split until they make it big and go mm. oh well i didn't think that was going to happen mm. uh, so you know stood by it and, and did the split but wow it was still a lot of money after the split right that was still yeah, my, yeah, yeah. still my best event after splitting it three ways so it was fine uh, as far as i was concerned because if i'd have got that amount hacking by myself i would have been ecstatic Mm. so mm. uh yeah but i i seem to you know because i was like featured on in a, in a couple of articles about the event and you know, retweeted by hacker one and all this sort of thing i started to gain a little bit of a following um with well, i think that's an understatement i think you went into a, a different stratosphere of of um uh of how people viewed tom nom nom right it wasn't it, it wasn't just this guy that's that's good at hacking. It's this guy that not only really knows his craft, but also contributes into the community. Like, look at your GitHub repo and when you've posted these tools. This has been going on for years. Um, and 
And I think everyone kind of cottoned on then. It was like, wow, this this, this guy's really game for, for giving back. So I think that's special, if I'm honest with you. And I, I wish more people would do it. I mean, I know I see a lot of, there's a lot of contributions from people about sharing the start of their journey with bug bounties and stuff and how they get started, the tools they use, and usually the tools they use are all of yours. Um, and it's almost like the stuff that you've written becomes a de facto standard for how people approach like reconnaissance, for example. Um, that, that must be an amazing feeling to think that there's just thousands of people out there using your tools and, and tweaking them for their needs and stuff to to progress their own careers. Yeah, it, it, it is a good feeling. Um, and I think, you know, I've not, I don't think, like I haven't invented anything like mm. new, especially. I think what I've done, uh, and other people were doing this as well, you know, and I'm, I'm definitely not the first, but because I'd spent a lot of time in the software engineering world and also in the operations world. So like I'd software engineer, then I was DevOps engineer, sysadmin sort of a person for a while and so on and so forth. Um, I think one of the things that I brought to the table was this idea of using the Unix philosophy of small mm tools that deal with text streams talking to each other like the, the bash one-liner is just a common thing in the bug bounty world now but from what i remember it didn't used to be mm. it, it you know it was the tools that are still there and still great like burp suite for example um were there and then there's the single purpose sort of tools things like nmap and sql map mm. and they're still there and they're still great but for the most part they're standalone tools um I, and with that comes a certain amount of power but also a certain amount of inflexibility uh where you know if your situation is slightly different then things get hard really quickly mm. um, I, and i wasn't working that way when i was a software engineer you know i was building tools like so grand for example that you mentioned earlier on, you know, that was that comes from a time before I'd done any bug bounty stuff. Um, that was, but that was just my approach to solving problems was write these small Unixy tools. Mm. So that was the way I did it. Um, I, I remember know. you saw. I think I think it was with maybe Stoke or someone. I can't remember who you were talking to about. That I was watching a while ago now, uh, probably discussing Asset Finder. Um, and you, I think someone was, someone asked you like, well, why, you know, where's the, uh, it might be not Hamsek actually, you know, where's the fancy uh, banner when you, when you run the tool and stuff and, you know, where's the, the, the colored output. And you were like, no, no, it's just pipe from one tool to another. Do it really well. And I remember I personally, I took that, I was like, do you know what? It's so right. And I, I remember stripping out all of the, all of the noise from my own output going, I just want a list of URLs or I just want a list of output, you know what I mean? And it works really well. You're right. That mindset, that Linux approach of like do one thing, do it really well and, you know, connect the dots with other tools. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a tough call because I love the aesthetic of the ASCII banners. Yeah. Like that hack, <laughs> like, the thing for me, like the old, the NFO files you used to get with software cracks, uh, and stuff like that. <laughs> not that I ever used them. Like, no, of course, no, no, no. no. The artwork, uh, but, <laughs> you know that that kind of aesthetic, uh, like green text on a black. I love it. That's I, you know, it. I feel like it's part of my identity, but at the same time, I uh, you know also try to be pragmatic. Mm. Uh, and, and say, you know, the tool has to be usable first and foremost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember um, when I first wrote Meg, uh, I actually, someone contacted me and said, it's not working. I thought, why isn't it working? So I run it and there's no output. Thought, yeah, that's because it works. <laughs> um, and, and, and that was kind of a, another thing that I hadn't really thought about was, uh, is the, the lack of extraneous output like the progress bars and, and all this mm. kind of thing. And part of the old school Unix way of doing things is if it worked, say nothing. Uh, and, you know, that has its origins rooted in the fact that people were using teletypes that were right, were printing out onto paper. Amazing. So yeah. you don't want to, you know, when things work, you don't want to waste, you know, multiple centimeters of paper reel telling them that it worked 
Mm. You only want to tell them if something didn't work because that's the only time they would need to take action, right? So mm. like a, a lot of that stuff kind of bleeds into the way I've done things. And I think it makes it unexpected. So there's some unexpected consequences for some people. I love it. I, I honestly love it. And I admire so many of your, um, I mean, I look down the list of tools that you've written that I use almost on a daily basis. And I'm so impressed. And I love the fact that I can go and view the source code like you, you know, 20 years ago, when you control you, you have a look at the view source of a of a shonky web page. It's mm-hmm. the same for me. I think everyone has that same passion inside of them to say, how did he write Meg? And you yeah. can go on GitHub and see it. And it's amazing. And, and and not only that, you can go, well, do you know what? I could take this bit and I could take that bit and I can, you know, do something over here. Do you know what I mean? And it's... Yeah. Uh, and people have. Mm. There's a, a whole bunch of tools on YouTube now that... Not YouTube. On GitHub now that the people are using that started off as a, a copy and paste of something I wrote. Uh, yeah. And they made it do something different, which is awesome. And mm. And that's important to me because I know I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for ViewSource in a web browser. Mm. So I want that to be everywhere as yeah, much as possible. I love it. That's that's a fantastic quote. Yeah, is, is it? So um, out of tools, um, what, what would you say your favorite is? I mean, it can be yours. It can be someone else's. You know, what's your, uh, you know, what's your go-to at the moment or the one that you yeah. see? Yeah, that's 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 fantastic, and I use it day to day. You don't have to say anything from Detectify. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's incredibly difficult to pick one because it, inherently difficult to pick one because they're designed to work together. Um, and, and, you know, if you were to ask a carpenter whether they prefer their plane or their chisel, they'll ask what they're doing at the time, yeah. you know. Um, or maybe even a better example would be hammer or chisel. Sort of, well, I need both, right, mm. to achieve what I need to do. You can do a little bit with, with just the one. Uh, but the real power is unlocked when you're using multiple things and you're changing the order in, in which they're used, right? So um, I think th- there's a soft spot in my heart for Gron because it got really popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so for anyone not familiar with Gron, it turns JSON into a series of individual uh, JavaScript assignments so that you can see the full sort of path to a value. Um, I've used that so many times, you've no idea. <laughs> so uh, the G in Gron is for, or the GR in Gron is for grep, and the ON is for JSON. So it's Gron. Uh, mm. and, and, you know, I wrote that because I needed it. Uh, and I wrote it in PHP. And then when I was learning Go, I rewrote it in Go uh, to make it easier for people to use. Uh, and then a bunch of people started using, uh, you know, um, I, I, I can't remember exactly, uh, when it took off. I think it got posted in one of the tech newsletters, like change log or something like that. Mm. Um, uh, and it, it got a lot of popularity from there. Uh, but at some point someone added it to like the default Ubuntu apt repos, like, like you mentioned earlier on. So you can apt install run, which is slightly What's mind-blowing um, yeah. but uh and you know people still tweet at me every now and again saying i've just found this tool and it has improved my life <laughs> like i'm dealing with a horrible undocumented api that returns 500k <laughs> of json and it has made it so much easier to you know figure out what the structure of this thing is and and mm-hmm. how i get to the data that i want it's remarkably common to have a massive bit of JSON and you want exactly one value out of it. That's true. That is so um, true. Yeah, crazy common for that stuff to happen. Uh, and, well, you know, tools like JQ and things will let you process that JSON if you know the structure. But I didn't know the structure, so I needed something different. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's always a soft spot for, for Gron there because of its popularity and still and its usefulness to this day i use it regularly which i think is Mm. a good sign of a good tool um similar soft spot for meg because it was one of the first sort of security related tools i wrote that got used by other people there is a lot i would change if i was rewriting it today it's not a very good unix citizen for example 
Um, it doesn't have much extraneous output, but still the output's not super useful and it doesn't really read things on standard in so well and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I have a kind of a re replacement for Meg that I use a lot now, which is two tools. Uh, one is uh, Comb, which does the sorting side of, of the input, and then there's uh, FFF, which is the fairly fast mm. fetcher, or the frequently failing fetcher, depending on how. <laughs> um, and you know, and I use those two together to eff effectively get the uh, functionality of Meg, but with less code in total, which I think is a really interesting thing there, because you don't have to write the glue. Mm. Uh, because Bash does that for you, mm. but it also means that you know I I have these individual parts that are more powerful. Now, it's more powerful because I split them apart, because I can use that FFF tool uh, fed with the uh, output of any other tool, mm. you know, like way back URLs or um, uh, just a text file full of URLs that I have, for example. Whereas mm. Turns out doing that with Meg was a bit of a pain. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's They're a couple, good ones. Of, couple yeah. that are up there um, for sure, um, but really hard to pick an individual one. Sorry. Mm. No, it's perfect. So, what, what's um, kind of what's what's next for you? You know, you you've got your you've got your team now, and you're you know you're working on that. What do you see for the next you know few months and years? What what are you working on? Uh, so I'm trying to become a, a better manager uh, and a better leader. It's not my strong suit. Um, um, so I think that's like the main focus for me. Um, also, you know, trying to move house and that sort of thing <laughs> over the next few months. Uh, times are very strange at, at, the, at the time of recording. So a, a lot of things are difficult. And I'm trying to take a lot of me time uh, right now, doing uh, not very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 plus 2 has just come out. For, <laughs> so, <laughs> <Not> <laughs> trying to play that. Um, th th that kind of thing. Um, but I think I never know uh, is the thing. Like, I've on occasion and, and quite recently, even I've gone, oh, I've got the urge to go and write a tool. Or, or something like that, and I can't. Mm. I can't do it. Um, I can't go. Oh, I want to write something. What am I going to make? I'll do. I'll make this and go. Just go and do it. I've tried it in the past, but I never finished them mm. um, because I need a problem to work on. Mm. Right. Um, basically, everything I've written came out of a problem that I had, or a problem that someone else had. Um, uh, and part of that taught me that I'm not the best ideas guy uh i'm i'm an execution guy like you have an idea i'll help you do it i'll mm. help you solve that problem um and, and like that's happened a couple of times uh for various tools that are mostly in my hacks repo which for those not familiar is my repository of experiments and things that i wrote in 20 minutes Diamonds in the rough, I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes they kind of get promoted into their own repos if they become useful enough or enough people use them or or just demand that it happens. Um, but, uh, you know, some of those things are, are things I wrote at a live event because someone approached me and said, we're trying to do this thing and, and we can't because we don't have the tooling. Do you have anything that can do this? Uh, and you know, the answer is no, but let's write something, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll do it now. It'll take half an hour or, or something like that. Uh, and I think, you know, doing those things is one of the things that helped me overcome a little bit of, of the imposter syndrome that, that I talked about earlier on, because mm. I'd not really programmed in front of people that much, mm. you know, sort of, oh, I've done this thing and now it's on GitHub. And, and you don't know, you know, how long did this take? Is this a day's work or is it? Uh, how much Google was involved? A yeah. week or something like that. And then like the first time I sat down with a couple of other hackers and wrote something uh, and, you know, it took sort of half an hour or so. They were like, how did you do that? 
that would have taken us, a, you know, a day. Uh, like you didn't Google for anything <laughs> while, while you were coding. How did you do that? Lots of lots of programming, you know. Just learn enough. Uh, mm. Can't know everything, so learn a tool set that is good enough to get your thoughts into code, um, even if it's not in the best way. Mm. Like step one: make it work. Or worry about making it look nice uh, mm. later. And sometimes that means I, you know, write ten lines of code when I could have written two. Uh, but it means that I get to do it quickly. Mm. It's, uh, there's an old quote from I don't know who, uh, which was, "If I'd have had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter," <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. I'm paraphrasing, I love that. but yeah. you know, it's absolutely true. It's anyone can sit and knock out a hundred lines of code, but to sit and solve the same problem in twenty, that's the bit that requires attention mm-hmm. and uh, uh, real careful consideration is paring things down afterwards well tom listen you, you you're so inspiring your mindset your insights how you think about solving problems um and where that all came from i think uh, honestly i've learned so much uh, just from speaking to you in the, in the last uh, uh short period that we have uh, so Thank you for spending your time with us today, no sharing your journey, sharing your insights. So honestly, I think you're going to get uh, some great feedback from our audience as well. So, Ashley, any final words from your good self? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was really good to to hear how you how you started. It, it was, it was fantastic. I was mesmerised. I was just listening and thinking, this is you're so smart, just so <laughs> so smart. It's uh, I'm basking in your glory. So yeah, thanks for yeah. coming on. Thank you.